When I say smartphone, you're not instantly going to think of polymers. However, if you've got a slim smartphone, polymers are already making your battery work. And in the future, all our smartphones displays may well be using polymers to make them light up. So, how does this all work? When atoms bond, the atomic orbitals overlap to form new orbitals, molecular orbitals. We still feel these from the lowest energy upwards. Once we've assigned all our electrons to our molecule, we're going to reach a point where there's vacant molecular orbitals that haven't been occupied. The highest occupied molecular orbital is called the HOMO, and the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital is called the LUMU, and there's an energy difference, a band gap, delta E, between these two orbitals. If we were to supply this energy, then a molecule would excite and promote an electron from the HOMO to the LUMU. If we were to allow this molecule to de-excite, then the electron would jump back down from the LUMU to the HOMO, and in the process re-release this energy, while the forms of this energy release is as a photon. When an electric current is passed through certain materials, these materials excite and de-excite and release photons, and this is a property we call electroluminescence. Now certain polymers have been found to be electroluminescent, so we can cash in on this property and use these polymers to produce light for us via the use of a device called a POLED, a Polymer Organic Light Emitting Diode. The simplest of POLEDs would consist of an anode, a cathode, and the electroluminescent polymer sandwiched between the two. The cathode injects electrons into the lumu of the emissive polymer, whereas the anode removes electrons from the homo of the emissive polymer, even though we prefer to think of this as the injection of an electron hole, the absence of an electron. This leaves our emissive polymer in the excited state as an electron occupying the lumu when it could be occupying the homo. So the polymer de-excites, the electron drops down an energy level, releasing this energy as a photon. When the electron and the hole meet each other, they cancel each other out. If the hole is the absence of an electron and we stick an electron in it, we just have the normal situation restored. So what polymers are suitable for use in PLEDs and why? Well the first polymer used in a PLED was PVB and the repeat unit is shown here. If you were to google PVB you'd learn that it's conjugated. In fact you'd find that all the polymers used in PLEDs are conjugated. But what is conjugation? Well a conjugated system is a system of connected P orbitals in which electrons can be delocalized. A fine example is benzene, where six adjacent p orbitals have overlapped to form a delocalized ring system. And we can notate this conjugation of benzene in one of two ways. We can draw a hexagon with a ring in it, or we can draw two structures connected by a double-headed arrow. And what I mean by the double-headed arrow is that the real structure of benzene has contributions from both of these structures. If we were to take a stretch of PPV three repeat units long, I could draw for you two structures and connect them by a double-headed arrow to try and communicate the real structure of PPV. If you take contributions from both of these structures, we can see that there's delocalization of electrons along the entire PPV backbone, that the PPV polymer is conjugated. The conjugation gives rise to some of the properties we need from the polymer. Because of the delocalization, any injected charges are pretty mobile across PPV polymer molecules. And this is important for an OPLED because any injected electrons and holes need to be able to find each other due to the high mobility, they're quite likely to find each other, cancel out and release photons. PPV luminescence is green. We're going to need more than just the colour green before we can build up a phone screen. So the colour of a photon is dependent on its frequency and the frequency of a photon is dependent on the photon's energy and the energy of a photon released via electroluminescence is equal to the energy difference between the HOMO and the LUMU. So if we can tune the energy difference between the HOMO and the LUMU, then we can choose which colours we're going to get. One of the ways we can do this is by adding substituents, R groups, to our basic PPV structure. Now different R groups will have different effects, but the vast majority are electron donating, as they tend to have P orbitals that can overlap with the other P orbitals in PPV to join the conjugation, to join the localization. The effect of this is to lower the energy difference between the HOMO and the LUMU, which means our released photons will be of lower energy, which means we're going to gain access to colours such as yellow, orange and red. Adding substituents will al also alter other properties of the polymer, such as electrical conductivity. Having alkyl oxy substituents will increase the conductivity of the polymer because it makes the polymer easier to oxidise. Having long side chain substituents, however, will lower the conductivity of the polymer because the side chains make packing of the polymer a lot more difficult, which means charges will find it a lot harder to hop from polymer chain to polymer chain. So we have access to the colours yellow, orange and red, but how do we gain access to the colours blue and purple? 
One of the ways we can do this is by restricting the conjugation length we allow our polymer to have. The longer the conjugation length, the smaller the energy difference, delta E, between the HOMO and the LUMU. So if we can restrict the conjugation length, we're going to be increasing the energy difference between our HOMO and the LUMU, giving us access to higher energy photons, the blue and purple end of the electromagnetic spectrum. One of the ways we can achieve this is by use of conjugated, non-conjugated block copolymers. A block copolymer is a polymer made from at least two different monomers, in which the different monomers make up different sections, different blocks of the chain. For a conjugated, non-conjugated block copolymer, we can see blocks of the polymer that are in conjugation, separated by blocks of polymer that aren't in conjugation. Now, a great way of synthesizing conjugated, non-conjugated block copolymers is by the Wittig route. So first, we're making the different monomers of our copolymer, and then, in the presence of a strong base, these monomers will react together in a polycondensation reaction via the Wittig mechanism, which you will learn about in uni, to form our conjugated, non-conjugated block copolymer. Your phone will run on a lithium-ion battery, the electrodes of which are made from lithium insulation compounds. Lithium ions and their charge balancing electrons sat in between the layers of another solid, such as graphite. Other key components of this battery are the electrolyte, a solvent that allows the lithium ions to pass between the electrodes, and a barrier that allows lithium ions through, but prevents the electrodes from ever coming into physical contact. A specialist polymer can facilitate the roles of both the electrolyte and the physical barrier, which is great news because, thanks to techniques such as spin coating or even inkjet printing, we can apply wicked thin layers of these polymers, which allows us to make ever slimmer batteries. Great if we're making ever slimmer smartphones. All we need from our polymer is we need groups that are capable of interacting with the lithium ions, and we need a certain degree of motional freedom within the polymer, so the lithium ions can actually be passed through it. PEO can be synthesised by linking polymerisation of epoxide, the mechanism of which I'm showing you here, where OH- is acting as a nuclear file and as my initiator, and the chain is growing during the propagation steps until I decide to stop chain growth by treating the reaction solution with acid. PEO is the most commonly used polymer electrolyte, so it just ticks all the boxes. We have oxygen atoms that can coordinate with our lithium ions, either by inter- or intra-polymer coordination, and we have no rigid side chains, no bulky side groups, so localised bond rotation and chain movements aren't very hindered, which gives PEO a low glass transition temperature. The mechanisms by which the lithium ions move through the polymer are heavily reliant on this localised chain movements and bond rotations. We have intra-polymer uh, transportation, where rotation around the bond has a swinging motion, moving the lithium ion forwards. And we have inter-polymer transportation, where lithium ion is passed between two polymer chains. Coupled together, these two transport mechanisms allow the lithium ion to move through the polymer. Goodbye, baby cakes. Take care.